Dana is a traditional auto supplier that's been around for over 100 years. It manufactures axles for all kinds of vehicles, but now it has to transform itself so it's ready for an autonomous and electric world. On this week's show, we discuss how Dana is getting ready for big changes in the auto industry. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week. Today, we're going to take a look at the supplier side of the business, especially a supplier that makes axles. And the reason we're doing that is we have Bob Pyle as our special guest. He's the president of Light Vehicle Driveline Technologies, at Dana. And Bob, it's great to have you on the show. Nice here. to be here today, John. Thank you. Also joining me for the journalist panel are David Welch from Bloomberg and Dave Sullivan from Auto Pacific. And great to have the both of you here. Thank you. Always good to be here, John. Uh, Bob, I'm fascinated by Dana. I mean, here's a traditional old time. You guys are what, about 100 years old or something yeah, like that? Yeah, longer than that, about longer 115 than that. years old. And making axles. And yet it seems to me like the company is transforming into sort of this leading edge company, at least when it comes to axles. What's the game plan here? Yeah, I think um, we're, we're really a company that is on the move. There, there is some unprecedented change happening, happening in the automotive industry, and we certainly want to be a part of that. And uh, our driveline products in particular have the potential to be impacted uh, in a meaningful way by the move to electrification, as well as connected cars and autonomous driving. And so we've made some moves. Uh, recently to make sure we're well positioned for the future in that regard. One of the things that it seems to me that you're doing is literally just bolting electric motors directly to axles and making sort of an electric powertrain out of that. In fact, you recently acquired a, a company in Quebec, I believe it was, for yeah. that regard, but you fill in the blanks. Yeah, that's right, John. So I think initially what a lot of companies are doing, especially in the sort of light commercial and commercial vehicle spaces to get electrified quickly is really sort of a bolt-on. It's either a, a motor uh, attached to a traditional transmission or a motor attached to an axle, but that's not really where the future lies. There's too much cost involved in doing that. And, and the future really is integrated e-drive units. And, and that's really where our acquisition of a controlling interest in TM4 was focused. The company, as you said, is based in Quebec. We purchased 55% of that company, and they're focused on making traction motors, inverters, and electronic control systems that will allow us, along with our traditional gearboxes and e-gearboxes that we already produce, to do a truly integrative solution that will be better cost, more power dense, and is really where the future of electrification is going from a drive unit perspective. So you can sell everything basically besides the battery and the power controls. I mean, is it a whole sort of self-contained system? Yeah, so that's, that's right. We'll be able to do systems. We think that's particularly important in our core spaces, which will become electrified a bit later. SUVs, pickups, commercial vehicles are coming earlier. Buses are coming earlier. So we'll, we'll be able to do all that and more because we're one of the only companies that can do electrified axles or electrified drive units, including uh, powertrain cooling capability that we have from our power technologies business. So we can cool batteries we could cool the inverters and we can cool the motors and we can do it across light vehicle, commercial vehicle and off highway vehicles. So we're, we're particularly excited about this acquisition and, and what it brings to Dana's customers going forward. It's like uh, so things from buses to to Wranglers. Um, yeah, that's every, right. Every so, so for us, I mean, we could go from passenger cars through class eight trucks uh, in North America. And then in the off-highway space, Dana supplies in agriculture, construction, and underground mining. And interestingly, underground mining and construction are also very focused on electrification as why, well. Why is that? Keeping the emissions out of the underground mine is really important. Uh, so going electrified mm -hmm. is really good there. And then just some of the efficiency of motions, whether, uh, you know, whether it's in the construction construction space or agriculture space. Now, is there some, well. what's driving this change for you guys? Is it um, you know, demand of your customers, regulatory, um, or is it uh, more of the companies trying to have a uh, look like a you know good corporate, uh, you know, we're good helping the environment and that type of uh, image? What, what is it, what's driving the uh, 
you know, development of Yeah, I, I think product. it's mostly customer driven. I mean, our strategy is to really make sure we're supporting our customers and we watch megatrends. Consumer demand is certainly heading toward electrification for a number of reasons. The regulations, of course, have a lot to do with that, but also things like uh, challenges in the diesel space uh, are causing a lot of European countries to consider a lot of regulations related to uh, zero emission vehicles in city centers, and we need to be prepared for all of that. You look at China and what they're doing with the environment, uh, buses are becoming electrified at a very rapid pace. So we're making sure that we're ready for all of those changing trends. Bob, you mentioned that you see this happening sooner on the commercial vehicle side than in light vehicles that retail customers like you and I might buy. What's driving it? Why, why is the, the commercial vehicle sector leading the charge? So I think we're really seeing sort of two areas. So in, in commercial and buses, in particular in China, we see them going very quickly there. We see light commercials, think city delivery vehicles going there very quickly. Some of these European regulations that I talked about would, would be a great example of that. And then on the light passenger cars, they're obviously going there quickly. Companies like Tesla and a lot of OEMs are going there. In our more traditional segments at Dana, pickups and, and larger SUVs, we see those lagging by maybe one or two cycles, which give us some time to make sure we've got the right integrated solution with our uh, acquisition of TM4 helping to play a major role there. So what's your outlook on, on the consumer market for electric vehicles then? And, and, and that's the you know, $64 billion question. Um, is, you know, right now, for example, Johnson controls battery businesses for sale, and you've got a handful of private equity companies looking at it. Now, there's the lead acid uh, battery business, which is stable cash flow, but what these guys are looking at is what's the potential of the lithium ion side EVs. And you just, so you just made an acquisition uh, that, that says you're gonna get some growth in that area. Um, not the commercial side, but the retail side, what do you think is gonna happen? I, th I think consumers are going to be very, very favorably disposed toward electric vehicles. I think Tesla was a game changer in that regard. They, they made electrification really cool. I think you've seen uh, positive results from General Motors, from Ford, from Toyota. Uh, I, I think the tipping point has already happened in terms of consumer acceptance. I think when you see that coupled with autonomous vehicles and some of the connected capabilities of cars, uh, I don't think it's a trend that's going to go away. I think it's going to accelerate. We're seeing every six months, as we look at our strategy, uh, the rates of electrification and the projections thereof are going faster, not slower. So there, there clearly needs to be some infrastructure that catches up for it to be a profitable enterprise for everybody involved. Technology needs to advance, but I, I don't think it's a trend that is anything but here to stay. There's a lot of talk, too, of this uh, a rise of autonomous ride sharing. And the talk seems to be that it could go either electric or hybrid. How do you see it going? I think it's a good question. I, th I think ride sharing is a really interesting concept. It, it takes an asset that is probably one of the least used assets that people have and, and makes it much higher utilization rate, so it makes the economics uh, better for most people. Um, I don't think it really matters whether it will be uh, fully electric or if it will be hybrid. I think it really depends on the use of the vehicle. You think robocabs in a big city like Shanghai or New York, I think uh, fully electric will be the way to go. Longer trips, you, you'll need better range, so that could be different. But I think that's another concept that's, that's coming on strong. You're very bullish on electric vehicles. What do you think about autonomous ones? I think autonomy is going to take some time. I think level four is a, a very realistic goal. Not so sure about level five. I think it will start in certain zones and in certain places. Uh, I don't think we're any time soon going to see full level four autonomy across the entire continental United States or continental Europe. Don't you think it'll start out uh, like Cadillac Super Cruise works right now. And Super Cruise, of course, is an adaptive cruise control where you don't have to put your hands on the steering wheel. You can just cross your arms or put them on the armrest. It only works on highways. Don't you think that's how level four autonomy is going to start? On mapped highways. Yeah, I think. And then grow from there. For sure, that's, that's the way it will start. I think, you know, the, the changes that can happen 
to a society when you really get to level four in terms of mobility for more people. You, you improve the safety of passengers and pedestrians dramatically. You eliminate some of the things that cause um, a lot of highway fatalities, whether it's drunk driving or distracted driving. All of these things that people worry about all the time that are real problems can be solved or at least dramatically improved through autonomous driving. And so I think it's something that we're very bullish about and uh, is something that we need in society. Mm -hmm. There was a, uh, you know, a lot of talk about, you know, something that nobody had really considered until Elon Musk unveiled the, the electric semi. And I mean, is that, uh, is that something that's, you know, what are, what's Dana's take on, on, on electrification for, you know, a class eight? Yeah, uh, I think, I think like it's, that? I think it's very interesting. I think our view is that at least in the most near term, we see city delivery mm -hmm. and those shorter routes that don't, you know, not cross continent routes being the place for electrification. But there, there's certainly a place for electrified semis. Uh, but in a meaningful way, it's probably a bit further down the line than the city delivery. Kind yeah, of if you have this big heavy battery in a semi, then you got to put some heavy freight in there. Um, is it pretty much light loads to start with? I mean, the batteries weigh quite a bit as it is. And that really impacts the payload. I mean, yeah, like I mean, I think traditional pay powertrains are extremely heavy and bulky too. It's true. I, I think it's more down to the battery technology itself, the range and the cost of the batteries, and then you can uh, likely make long distance work, but I, I don't think we're there yet. Are you guys doing any business with Tesla or Nikola, the other one? That's we're not doing any significant business with Tesla. We've uh, worked with them a little bit, but uh, haven't found the right way in which to cooperate. But we are involved with a number of different companies in electrification that uh, are giving us a lot of experience. And, and it's largely initially focused on buses and light commercial vehicles today. What do you think of Nikola's idea of using a fuel cell instead of batteries for long Long haul and working with Budweiser and setting up these fuel cell, uh, or I should say hydrogen stations, where they make the hydrogen right on site and putting stations uh, across the western United States so these trucks can make the run. Does, does that make sense to you? Uh, John, I think fuel cells are very interesting. I mean, I've always felt that fuel cells have always been 30 years off, right? That was kind of the prevailing wisdom. But now we have Toyota and Honda with fuel cell vehicles in Japan. Uh, Dana actually has been involved in fuel cell battery technology, uh, or cooling technology, I should say, for quite some time. It's something that we've continued to invest in, and, and we, we think there is a place in the market for fuel cells. I mean, that's truly zero emission. You know, with a, with a battery electric vehicle, hybrid electric vehicle, you're still worried about the source of the battery energy, the electricity. Is it a coal plant? Is it a nuclear plant? Fuel cell, hydrogen is uh, more readily available and a bit different and, and really a cleaner solution. Mm -hmm. This is interesting that, that the two most technologically savvy, traditionally, Japanese car makers are going, basically thinking they can leapfrog or just skip battery and go straight to fuel cell. Yeah, I mean, and <laughs> the only EV we've seen from Toyota had a Tesla battery in it. Yeah, and I wonder is is this because they know something or they don't know something, right? Because the you think about autonomy, the, the center of uh, code writing and software development for autonomous driving is not Japan. It's it's the US, increasingly China, but really the US. The center of battery development is really Korea and China. The Japanese have kind of fallen behind in all of this stuff. So do they, do they know that fuel cell is, is better and they've got something coming? Or do they miss the boat on all this other stuff and they're putting their money here because everybody else is already there or there? And so that's just what I wonder. It's a good question. It is a good question. Well, I, I would point out, though, that uh, Honda is uh, jointly working with General Motors on fuel cells. And in right. fact, its fuel cells are going to be made in Michigan, not in Japan. Well, wasn't it, it's basically GM signing on to Honda's program, right? And co-developing, co but I thought... I, I don't believe so. I, I, I think it's a pretty yeah. even-steven uh, cooperation. And, uh, and the fact that they're going to build... GM is going to build the fuel cells in Michigan, I, th I think tells you it's, where the heavy weight of the program really lies. Well, you wouldn't build them in Japan, right? Because... You'll, you'll get more 
you'll have more vehicles to use them on here. Well, you may have to build them here. And that, that, that's a good segue for what do you make of President Trump saying, hey, we're going to start putting tariffs on everything? How might that affect your business? Yeah, it, it certainly uh, can and will have an impact, and it will affect people's strategies. I think you saw that uh, Harley-Davidson announced that they may offshore some production in light of some of these tariffs. Uh, it's going to cause people to rethink supply chains and uh, will ultimately affect the consumer, because someone ultimately will have to pay for these tariffs, at least in the short or medium term. So uh, a lot of volatility right how now. How much disruption would it be for your business? You, you know, I would say uh, relatively moderate disruption. I mean, we have pretty uh, well thought out supply chains, but frankly, I mean, NAFTA countries, I think we all know how frequently components and vehicles pass across the, the borders between the how US, Mexico, Mexico, and Canada. Or Canada that Significant. Could be yeah, significant in both right, locations right. from a supply chain perspective. And, you know, European tariffs, Asian tariffs are all going to be uh, a detrimental impact. You also have uh, operations in China, but is that mainly for the Chinese market or are you bringing stuff this way? It's mainly for the Chinese market, but we do have supply chains that involve China, Korea, elsewhere, right? just like many companies. It, it really is a global business and we sort of count on in our industry free trade. The, to, to allow us to do our, our work in the most efficient manner and bring the best value to consumers, ultimately. I got to believe that if President Trump does carry through, and we'll see by the time that this program airs, uh, we'll, we'll, we may even have an answer. But he's talking about 20 to 25 percent tariffs. The average car today has a sticker price of about $34,000. That means the average car would go up by seven or $8,000. Uh, and I got to believe that means car sales would collapse by millions of units. Do you, do you plan for any kind of doomsday scenario like that? So we're, we're certainly hopeful that a doomsday scenario will be averted. If you remember why President Trump initially talked about doing these kinds of things in the first place, it was to promote American jobs. So I think his ultimate vision would be one of two things. Either we all change our supply chains and bring everything home and have to make steel and everything else in the United States, or he'll use it as leverage to negotiate better trade agreements with our foreign partners. And I think he himself has basically made it known that one of those two things is, is what he's looking for. So, what, uh, the, you know, theoretically, though, how long would it take for you to readjust your supply chain? Um, you know, to try and avoid or minimize the risk to a tariff. That in some cases, there are certain things we could do relatively quickly, but if you take the entire global supply chain on balance and all of the testing and everything else that would be required to protect our customers and the consumer, way too long. Yeah. Yeah, think about Daimler or BMW. If you're talking a 31% tariff, uh, oh no, that, that's, sorry, that's what's on Harley. If you're talking a 20 or 25% tariff, both of those numbers have been kicked around 20 more recently. Uh, for them to avoid that, if they started digging a spot for a plant tomorrow, you're looking at two years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. And we may have that, a different president. That's fast. <laughs> we might, I'd say more like three years. We might, yeah, we, we, uh, we might have a different president then, too. So. Sure. So, they, so they're just going to have to hope for the best, you know, eat it, deal with it. Uh, because See, you, you, I, I tend to think that... Uh, the way that Trump negotiates, he, he asks yeah, for the moon, right? Exactly. And then he'll He's, compromise. It's the classic low ball, right? I wonder if, Bob, you're right that could we, and this idea has been floated, just get rid of tariffs altogether. But as you know, pickup trucks in the United States are protected by a 25 percent import tariff. And that is the golden goose for General Motors, Ford, and Fiat Chrysler. What would happen uh, to your business if that 25 percent tariff went away and anybody could bring pickups into this country? Yeah, I think there's already existing competition on pickups that others have made in the United States. I, I think the reality is that the chicken tax, as, as it's known, uh, was an effective trade barrier for quite a long time. But uh, the Japanese uh, make pickups around the world. They can make them here. But it's still a business segment that is dominated by Ford General Motors and Fiat Chrysler. So they, they have. And, you know, Toyota and Honda and Nissan have all made a run at it and with moderate success. And maybe I'm being kind calling it moderate. You take $10,000 cost uh, price out of that, and it could be a whole new ball game. I think a lot of consumers would consider a Toyota that's $10,000 cheaper all of a sudden. 
uh, maybe not made in the U.S. Maybe it's sure. coming in from uh, mm -hmm. Thailand or something sure. like that. But the, nothing oh. precludes those companies from manufacturing pickups here and averting that tax, and it right. still hasn't solved right. the market share issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the the Detroit Three are particularly adept at knowing that consumer, or should I say those consumers and those segments, yeah. and I think it will be some time before they cede that to anybody. Yeah. And labor is what, 6%, 5 6% of the cost yeah. of a vehicle? So, you know, if you were to take the Thailand-made pickup trucks to compete, say, with the Colorado Canyon and the Ranger that's coming, and, and it, you have to add 5% to the, actually it's not 5% of the cost, it's a couple percent maybe from the labor differential in Thailand or, or anywhere in Asia to here, there's not gonna be a cost advantage no matter how you slice it. They're gonna have to just compete toe to toe based on attributes, mm -hmm. design, engineering, brand. And yeah, I, I don't see that getting overrun. I, I think the bigger question here is um, what is the Trump administration trying to get to with this lowball, they, they certainly don't want 10, 15 percent tariffs, which is what they ended up with in China instead of 25, or 25, 31 percent tariffs going back and forth uh, across the Atlantic. Is I mean, this delaying, though, like this uncertainty? Does it delay any investment that you'd make in Mexico or here? Uh, not really. I mean, this really has been known as a potential happening since before President Trump was elected. So we really tend to base our strategies more around what our customers are doing, what consumers are doing, and what makes business sense for us. Don't get me wrong, when you think of things like 25% tariffs or getting rid of NAFTA or what have you, you have to think about it. But generally speaking, we've made our plans presuming that we will monitor the volatility, but that we'll get some clarity in the, in the relatively near term. Um, Elon Musk announced that uh, he, you know, he gave a few details about his upcoming pickup truck that if it ever happens, um, you know, that was going to have a standard dual motors for all wheel drive um, and a load leveling suspension. So I can only imagine it's an air suspension, but you know, looking at, you know, the Dana's business and axles and traditional, their traditional business and think about, you know, where Tesla foresees a pickup truck going. What kind of things are you guys doing in the meantime to boost fuel economy and um, uh, to keep you know the gasoline pickup truck business and other light vehicles uh, competitive in the fuel economy segment. What kind of new technologies do we are we seeing or consumers don't even notice that are there when they buy a, a vehicle? Sure, I, I think I think it's a great question. You know, there have been a number of things that we've been doing over the last several years to improve fuel economy. So uh, one is pretty traditional light weighting. So use of different materials to make our driveline products lighter and that helps boost fuel economy. Uh, maybe some more specific things that aren't as well known is what we would call improving the power density of our driveline products. So smaller packaging, uh, lower viscosity lubricant, uh, better gear meshing, uh, these kind of things mm. have caused us to put on the market in uh, the last couple of years the most efficient driveline products that are out there. So, uh, you know, we're making sure that internal combustion driven product is still improving from a fuel economy base. Uh, we're reducing the power losses. We're introducing things like disconnecting all wheel drive so that uh, it's on wheel, all wheel drive on demand. So you, you lose all those uh, power losses that happen in a full time all wheel drive system. So that, that's There's been a big There's still plenty well. of development work being done on on, com, you know, on combustion engine products. Uh, a absolutely, you think about 120 million, 130 right. million vehicles a year, even at an accelerating rate of electrification, there will still be a tremendous amount of internal combustion engine product being manufactured, let alone on the roads in an existing vehicle park. I mean, one of the things that we see as a big opportunity at Dana is that as automakers are turning their attention so much to connected cars, autonomous vehicles, shared mobility and electrification, things that they used to focus on as core, like doing axles in-house in a number of cases, are becoming much less core. And so we're seeing business that used to be captive at the OEMs coming our way to, due to our continued investment. Some of the things I just described in improving fuel economy and technology and torque uh, is giving us yeah. uh, a lot of opportunity I in the know, traditional space. You just mentioned you know, taking that business in-house, and you know, GM now, is uh, they brought some axle business back to them uh, in-house, which I thought was a really strange thing for a company that uh, 
has kind of you know spent a lot of money on new technology. But what's uh, is that is that a just a one off or is that a trend that you're seeing where? Some of these OEMs are taking business in house again. Yeah, it's 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 not really a trend. I think there may have been some specific reasons why that made sense for General Motors strategically, but uh, it, we are actually seeing the greater trend being the the opposite, where we're actually seeing more in house business uh, come our way. Or, but, or is that part to do with uh, the UAW jobs? Sometimes uh, GM has got to make a commitment to the union to keep X number of jobs, and sometimes they bring house in uh, work in house. For that, you're right, John. I mean, there there are a host of factors I think that could be at play. I can't really speak for for General Motors in this instance, but I but they definitely had good reasons why they would make an investment like this, and I think GM is doing really well right now. So I wouldn't bet against them. Hey, we're getting down to the very end here, but it looks to me on a global basis the market's coming to Dana in this sense. Passenger car sales are going down. Crossovers, SUV, pickup trucks are going up. This is a global phenomenon, not just in the U.S. And you tend to make axles for trucks, SUVs, and that sort of thing. Is, is that right? I mean, the future looks pretty good for you guys, if that's correct. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a time of a lot of volatility. All the factors that we talked about, despite that, we certainly see a number of trends that are favorable towards uh, Dana's business and Dana's strategy. But it's not one of those things where you can sit around and relax and say, yeah, we're lucky the trend is going our way. We have to be very, very focused. There's a lot of competition out there. Things can change in a minute. And so we're, we're, we're happy with uh, a number of the moves we're making, but there's more to come. Real good. With that, we're going to have to wrap it up. But Bob Pyle, President, Light Vehicle Driveline Technologies at Dana. Great to have you on the show. Thank you, John. And David Welch from Bloomberg and David Sullivan from Auto Pacific. Always great to have you guys on thank the you. show as well. Thanks, John. And as I always say, thank you for having tuned in.